Um, I want to let you know about some things before we go to Lorna's class. Um, and she begins this, uh, this last class, a three-part series uh, that was called The Search, Lessons uh, on Sharing Your Faith. And uh, so I want to share with you a few things here. Number one, our next class is going to be our very first, you need to come to this, our very first FOI Equip lecture series. We'll have a few of these throughout the year with a very special guest named Bassem Eid. Bassem Eid is a Palestinian human rights activist, and um, he's a Palestinian himself. He's actually a Muslim, but he has he's a secular Muslim, but he has a real uh, affinity for Israel and the Jewish people. And I just really think you'll benefit from his insights on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, kind of the state of the Palestinian people today, uh, some of the causes for their plight, um, and I think he's going to open your eyes. You might have seen him before on PragerU. He has a PragerU class if you're PragerU people. Um, and uh, he, you can see him on a ton of different videos. Um, but if uh, you can, you really can't register at foiequip.org just yet. We're putting it up on the internet. So I got a little excited there. And But uh, we'll put the link in the chat. Maybe Laura will be able to dig that up if she can and put it in the chat that will take you to the Zoom registration if you want to register tonight. Or soon enough, an email will come out and you can register then. But please come to our special first lecture series with Bassem Eid. I really think he'll open your eyes and give you as a Christian, I think, you know, a lot of people, they deal with the issue of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's usually a stumbling block to a conversation about Israel. I think having Bassem as a, as a resource will just really help you in making some good, uh, clear arguments for Israel's case in the land. And he's he's just a fantastic speaker as well. The next thing is this, uh, you know this, uh, have y'all seen this yet? It's called The Search. It's Lorna's book that she wrote about her, her, her journey to faith. And so if, I know she's been going through this series in light of this book. And so if you have not had an opportunity to purchase it yet, I wanna encourage you to do that. You can go to gofoi.org forward slash The Search. And there you can buy Lorna's book. I really encourage you to do it. I had to read this um, 20 years ago. Uh, and so it was a great um, resource for me when I was doing the Institute of Jewish Studies. And there are still students at certain Bible colleges that read it um, and, uh, and gain insight. So this is a great resource for you. You can take this class with you even through the book. Uh, again, that's gofoi.org forward slash the search. Um, the next people come to Israel with us. What are you waiting for? I mean, come on, let's go to Israel. You know what they just stopped doing? No more tests, none, bupkis, no more. No more tests are needed to get from, from the U.S. to Israel and from Israel back into the U.S. Uh, it's as it was before, um, before COVID, praise the Lord. You don't need vaccine rec uh, records, none of that. You can just come to Israel. Our next tour is October 28th through the 7th. Uh, 2022. Be sure to join us. We also have other dates prepped. Maybe you need some more time. March 17th, 2023. And then the following fall, if you need a, and a whole year, uh, October 27th is the fall trip as well. You can see all that information, register, get your name on a list, all of it at foi.org forward slash tours. Hey, just a little reminder, we've been leading tours since the 1970s when finally you could get on an airplane and comfortably make your way over to Israel. You don't have to go on a, on a boat. You didn't have to go on horseback. You didn't have to do any of that stuff. You could get there in hours. And that's, so we've been doing tours since it became easy for people to get over to the Holy Land. So we have expert staff, one of them being two of them on here, Steve Herzig, Tom Simcox, yeah, uh, we trips through the Holy Land. And so you want to be sure to join us on our foi.org forward slash tours up to Jerusalem trips, okay? Do that really quick. Maybe that's what they're showing. All right. Next thing, really quick, everybody. Sorry, well, Laura, I know I'm going to get into this. Uh, be sure to do your, check out the Seven Sheets of Israel. Um, our national conferences, in-person conferences are back. Praise the Lord. Um, so you can join us in person, either in July in Winona Lake or September in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We're going to be going through the Seven Feasts of Israel. It's going to be a great time. And then, hey, if you don't get Israel My Glory, you should get it. I'm hoping everybody here gets Israel My Glory because the editor in chief of Israel My Glory is doing the class. So you can get her book and the magazine. It's a, it's a double whammy. Okay. So be sure to go to israelmyglory.org. And you can, if you've never subscribed before, you get a one year free subscription. And Larna, uh, that's it. 
I'm handing it over to you, sister. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming, first of all. I really do appreciate you hanging in there with me. Um, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, one of the biggest issues that Jewish people have with Christianity, and that is believing in the deity of Christ. Um, I, Steve would probably agree with me uh, that it's there are a lot of issues, but this may be the number one. And it was the number one that I had trouble with too. Um, when I went to Hebrew school, one of the things, and I went to Hebrew school, let me tell you, I was in Hebrew school all the time, three days a week, all through uh, elementary school, junior high school and high school. And one thing that I was taught it was almost drummed into my head is that God abhors human sacrifice. God does not want human sacrifice. In fact, when we were studying the Old Testament, uh, the Lord was always angry at the Jewish people because they were starting to follow the gods of other countries. And one of the things they did was they started putting their, burning their children to the god Molech. And uh, the Lord was very upset. He said, I never commanded you to do this. This is terrible. You know, your children belong to me. And, I'm coming. Yeah. Oh, I, whoever that is, I can hear you. Oh. <laughs> so um, God hated human sacrifice. So the first thing that we, that I struggled with is, well, if God hates human sacrifice, why would he want somebody to die as a sacrifice. Growing up as I did in a very Catholic area, I always heard, you know, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Jesus died for the sins of the world. It didn't really make any sense to me because why would God want a man to die for sin? He abhorred that. So right away, I didn't believe it. And then when people were uh, worshiping Jesus as a God, to me, that was paganism because there's only one God. And, you know, my people went into captivity for worshiping other gods. We lost the land of Israel for worshiping other gods. So there wasn't any way that I was going to believe that a man was God. To me, that was paganism. It was idolatry. I thought that Christians or I didn't really know the difference between Christians and Gentiles who went to church, but I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought that they were pagans and I was not because I was worshiping the one true God, the God of Israel. I did not know how to deal with this. I wanted to know who is Jesus and my late husband told me he believed that Jesus was God. And I thought that was ridiculous. And I don't remember whether I told you this or not, but <clears throat> one day I said to him, I, I just, you know, I, I think that's ridiculous. We were talking about the subject and he said, well, I can believe that a lot quicker than I can believe a mortal man part of the Red Sea. Now I believed God used Moses to part the Red Sea. I didn't have any problem with that. And all of a sudden, the thought came into my head, what if God wanted to come to earth and be born of a virgin? Just what if? Who could stop him? If he's God, he can do whatever he wants. And that was really the beginning of my struggle because I needed to understand who Jesus was. Who is Jesus? My husband says he's God. His mother believed that Jesus was God. I had to know who he was. I understood the sacrificial system. One of the things that I learned in Hebrew school that was pounded into me was you had to bring a sacrifice if you were a sinner, when you, when you sinned, and you had to bring it to the temple, there was no other place to bring it. God got angry if you were sacrificing on every hill and under every green tree. It had to come to the temple. 
And what you did was you laid your hand on the head of the animal and the animal was slaughtered and the blood was applied and the blood was a covering for your sin. I understood that you were, what they did in those days was they were symbolically transferring their sins to the head of this innocent animal and the animal died as a substitute for them. I also knew really well that that animal had to be perfect. It couldn't have a broken bone. It couldn't have anything wrong with its skin. Like my poor Herbie has all these growths and things. He's 14 years old, my dog, and he's got all kinds of things wrong with him. That didn't cut it for God. The animal had to be perfect. And it says over and over and over again in that it had to be with the scripture, the Torah says without spot, without blemish, without spot, without blemish. So and at one point, God got so angry at the Israelites because they were bringing every animal that had a defect to him. And he said in Malachi, you wouldn't give this to a, uh, you wouldn't give an animal like this to an earthly king. I am a great king. You know, how can you give this to me? So I knew that God demanded perfection in his sacrifices. I really went through a terrible time of struggling. And I want to mention this to you. If any of you deal with unsaved people, I'm not sure that this applies just to Jewish people. I think this really applies to anyone. You really, well, we really have to be patient. Things that seem clear to us aren't clear to people who don't know the Lord because they, the Holy Spirit reveals things to them, but I think he reveals it a little bit at a time because people can't handle everything all at once. So he'll reveal a little bit at a time. I remember I, I had gotten to the point where I was so tormented because I didn't know what the truth was. I was searching for truth. Now, my background was as a newspaper reporter. I started working at the newspaper in my hometown. It was the biggest newspaper in Vermont when I was 18. And in the old days, journalism was maybe not ever great, but it was way, way different than it is today. There wasn't advocacy journalism like there is today. I worked for an editor who refused to allow editorializing in the news columns. He said, you give people the facts and you let them decide for themselves. You don't tell them what to think. And I was taught you just had to get the truth. The truth was the most important thing. You printed the truth, you printed the facts. And all of a sudden, I didn't know what was true. And that was an important truth to me because I was terrified of going to hell. I believed in heaven. As I said, I was probably a little bit different than most Jewish people, but I knew I had studied the Old Testament and I believed it. So I believed that God, I believed in God. I believed that God would uh, have a place for people that were righteous and that he punished people who weren't. And I was terrified of not going to heaven. And I think that terror uh, got greater as I was talking about last week. Uh, it really be was magnified because my mother-in-law, I knew she was going to heaven. <clears throat> so I was desperate to find out the truth. I had reached a point one time, I remember I was driving home from somewhere and I was so confused and so mixed up and I wanted to believe that Jesus was my Messiah. I desperately wanted to believe because I wanted what my mother-in-law had and I was crying. And I kept saying, Lord, you have to help me believe. You have to help me believe. But I couldn't believe. I, I, it just wasn't there. And I think when we, I, I really believe that God has to give you faith. If God doesn't give you the faith to believe, 
you're never going to get there. So if you're talking to unsaved people, we have to be really patient with them because it's only in God's time that they're going to get saved. And even if something seems logical to them, if they don't have faith, even if they pray, they may not even be uh, really saved after they pray. So it really wasn't until I, I called my friend Nancy. She was my Jewish friend from childhood. We became best friends when we were 12 years old. We're still best friends today. She's like my sister. She's really the sister I never had. And I called her and she was living out in California and she had been praying for me for a whole year. And she was kind of shepherding me through this process because whenever I had a question, I would go to her. And I said, I, I don't know what to do. I'm going crazy. I can't sleep. I, I'm tormented. I need to know the truth. <clears throat> it took her a whole year of reading all kinds of things that a believer had given her, one of her friends who she worked with. And I told her, I, and I had already tried to read the Bible and I read some of it. The, I started in the gospel of John, but a lot of things just didn't make sense to me. And I think I told you, I got to John 316 and I put my own name in it for God so loved Lorna. The Lord must have told me to do that. And I told her, I said, Nancy, I don't have a year. I'm going to kill myself if I don't know the truth. I need to know. And she said, why don't you try read, reading the book, The Liberation of Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey? Well, try find The Liberation of Planet Earth at a regular bookstore. I went to one bookstore and they thought it was about an alien invasion. <laughs> And nobody had it, nobody had it, nobody had it. So I was in North Carolina with uh, my husband. We were at his mother's farm for Christmas. And I ended up going in those days to the Myrtle Beach Mall. And lo and behold, they had something I'd never heard of, a Christian bookstore. I'd never heard of a Christian bookstore in my life. And I went to the sales clerk and I asked her I said I'm looking for the liberation of planet earth by Hal Lindsey and she said you know I think we have a copy of it and she went all the way to the back of the store and she picked up a book on the shelf of a completely different title and behind it was one copy the only copy the store had of the liberation of planet earth. I truly believe the Lord had saved that copy for me. I bought it, it was a little paperback. And you know, um, I met Hal Lindsey a couple number of years ago at a booksellers convention that I was at for Friends of Israel. And I told them that that book changed my life. I got saved reading it. He started crying. And he said, funny that you got saved reading that because most people, you're the only one I've met who got saved reading that book. He said, most people get saved reading the late great planet earth, which, you know, was on the New York times bestseller list forever and ever. And I met, I've personally met probably 20 people who told me they got saved in the seventies reading the late great planet earth. And he told me something that made perfect sense to me afterwards. I realized why that book spoke to me so well. He said, I write every book. I have a reader. And he said, I write it as though I'm speaking to a 14 year old Jewish boy. And I thought that was why this book made so much sense to me because it tied together a lot of the things I learned in Hebrew school with the New Testament. And the key passage for me was when how Lindsay was going, he was explaining sacrifice and he was going into the book of Hebrews and teaching it basically. And he said that why would animal sacrifice have to be done? He talked about Yom Kippur, you know, and he said, why would animal sacrifice have to be done over and over and over again, if it actually removed sin. 
it really only covered sin temporarily until the one final sacrifice could be done. And that was God himself. God alone is perfect without spot, without blemish. And he came in the person of Jesus Christ. The rest was all stopgap measure until the one perfect sacrifice once for all. And I read that and it was like a light flashed in my head. It was all of a sudden I understood why Jesus had to be God. Because if he came as a sacrifice, he had to be perfect and only God is perfect. And he explained that if that sin comes through the father, the sin nature is transmitted through the father. I won't get into all the theology, but that's why Jesus couldn't have an earthly father. He had to have God, the father as his father and the Holy Spirit. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit because had he had an earthly father, he would have just been an ordinary human being, just like everybody else with a sin nature. And he had no sin nature. So in one fell swoop, I understood why the sacrifices, why, number one, I understood why the temple could be destroyed. I never could understand why would you allow the temple to be destroyed, God? I remember being a 10-year-old kid in Hebrew school, looking out the windows. We were discussing the temple sacrifice. And I, I, I said to myself, why would he allow the temple to be destroyed if that's the only place we can bring sacrifice? And now we have no sacrifice. And he says we need a sacrifice. Well, in one fell swoop with the liberation of planet Earth, I understood we didn't need the temple anymore because he had provided the one final sacrifice in his own person, in the person of his son, who was clearly God and clearly was virgin born. And I thought, this is it. This is true. I know this is true. This is what I believe. And all of a sudden, it was like a giant light in front of my face. And like the whole world looked different to me. I tried to figure out before I came to Christ, what the rabbis taught. And I knew that the rabbis had said, you don't, you don't need sacrifice anymore. Now, all I had when I was growing up was Old Testament. We studied the Torah. We studied the prophets. And God was always upset with the Israelites. He was always mad at us for something, mostly because we worshiped other gods. We didn't keep the Sabbath. We basically didn't do anything the prophets said. And we became as bad as the pagan nations that God had driven out of Canaan. And here I have Moses on the one hand, who initiated the whole sacrificial system. And he was the one who actually anointed his brother Aaron as high priest. And I've, I've always loved the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses is telling them everything, you know, this is going to happen to you if you follow God, and this is going to happen to you if you don't follow God. And here I have present day rabbis basically contradicting Moses. So I had to stop and think, you know, this, what I was reading in the liberation of planet earth that kind of fulfilled what Moses was saying. It didn't contradict Moses, but what the rabbis were telling me today contradicted Moses because what they're saying is it's all good works now. Rabbinic Judaism is a religion of good works. It's good deeds, mitzvot. And it's a mitzvot to do this, or it's a mitzvot to do that. And it's like, you're getting points with God. If you do X, Y, Z, or A, B, C, and God weighs your good deeds and your bad deeds on some sort of heavenly scale, and you never really know until you drop dead, basically, <laughs> whether you made it into heaven or not. 
So what actually happened is when the temple was destroyed, you know, there's two temples in the history of the Jewish people. There was Solomon's temple, which was destroyed by the Babylonians in uh, 586 BC, when the Babylonians just destroyed Jerusalem, they burned the temple to the ground, and they took the Jewish people captive into Babylon for 70 years. Then there was the second temple, which we refer to as Her there's Solomon's temple was the first, and then the second temple, Herod um, embellished. It was initially, initially uh, started when the Jewish people came back from captivity, but it was really a tiny little thing. And when Herod, under the Roman Empire, Herod really, he had this huge program and he built this gigantic, he was quite the architect apparently, and he built this gigantic temple. And that one was destroyed by the Romans in 70. As I've heard it told, uh, the rabbis had to, the ones that are left in, after 70 AD, we're trying to figure out what do we do now? We have no temple. Where do we bring the sacrifices? So they came to the conclusion that God no longer demanded sacrifice. I just got a message that my internet is unstable. So if something happens, let me know, Chris. Okay. Um, oh, no. You're still good, Lorna. We see you. Am I good? Okay, because it froze on my screen. Um, so they came up with Hosea 6.6, 6, which says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So out of one verse, they created a whole religion that basically negates the entire book of Leviticus and numbers because there was sacrifice in numbers as well. So this is where rabbinic Judaism is. So anybody who um, you are talking to probably, unless it's someone who knows the Hebrew scriptures, they, they may not even understand the Levitical system. They may not even understand the concept of sacrifice, of physical animal sacrifice. Now, the people who do understand this concept are the ultra-Orthodox. There are several branches of Judaism. The ultra-Orthodox, apparently they... They like to be called Orthodox, but a lot of people call them the Hasids, the Hasidim. They're the ones that wear the all the black. They have the payas, the side curls that come down, the men, and they wear the black hats and the black coats, and they have their tales that comes with the fringes that come down. You see them a lot in Lakewood, New Jersey, those of us who are from New Jersey, and uh Brooklyn, Williams, Williamsburg, New York. These are the ultra-Orthodox. And they actually have a concept of animal sacrifice, believe it or not, because, I, and I don't know if the Orthodox do. There's ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, conservative. I'm going down from the most observant, the most... Um, the one, the people who actually try to keep whatever laws they can starts the most with the ultra orthodox, the orthodox, conservative, reform, and reconstructionist. And I was conservative. My synagogue broke off from the orthodox synagogue, and my mother was orthodox. So when my mother was growing up, she actually told me they did this with her. She grew up in Montreal and there was a certain holiday, and I honestly, I can't remember which one. It, it might be before Yom Kippur, where her uncle, who was an Orthodox rabbi, they used to kill a chicken. And it's called Steve. I don't know if you, maybe he, he can chime in if he wants to. It's called, in, I don't know if it's the Hebrew or probably the Yiddish, because my mother mostly would have 
given it to me in Yiddish. It's called Schlugen Kaporas. Kapora is a covering. And they called it Schlugen Kaporas. It's like slinging. They, they take the chicken and they swing it over your head. And if you, and that's supposed to, supposedly, if you're a girl, you have to have somebody else do it for you. I don't, I don't know whether it's the rabbi who does it even for a man, but they're trying to sit, what they're trying to do is to transfer their sin to the chicken. And then they kill the chicken and the chicken is supposed to take the place of, you know, their, the sacrifice, the chicken has their sin. If those of you who read uh, Israel, my glory, Svi Kalisher, we've run a couple columns on this because they do it in Israel with the ultra Orthodox and Svi would go uh, into Mea Shireen, the Orthodox, ultra Orthodox section of Jerusalem. And he would talk to these people and he would tell them, why are you swinging this chicken over your head? You know, does the Bible talk about killing a chicken? Where does it say you take a chicken? And you put your sins on the chicken because, of course, nothing in the Bible talks about a chicken, but there's no temple. There's no place to bring a sacrifice to God. And I think there are some people in their heart of hearts where they realize they that rabbinic Judaism doesn't have all the answers. If all you have is are the Hebrew scriptures then the, it demands sacrifice at the temple, if that's all you have. Now, unfortunately, Jewish people have more than the Hebrew scriptures. They have the Talmud. And you know how God says in the Bible, don't add to my word or take away from it. They have added volumes and volumes. And Svi used to call these things uh, fables and old wives' tales. There's some of them are stories about rabbis. They'll about a rabbi talking to another rabbi, and they come up with a story that's supposed to somehow tell you a little bit about God. But instead, what they do, and some of it is interpretive too, uh, trying to interpret scripture. But, but what these stories do is they bring God down to a human level. And God is not on our level. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. My ways are higher. You're, you'll never understand. But what he shows us, he expects us to, what he shows us in his word, he expects us to understand and obey. And I think that in the ultra-Orthodox psyche somewhere, there's the knowledge deep down that good deeds aren't enough because why would they do this shlug and kaporis thing with the chicken? And we've had pictures of it in Israel, my glory. And you can go online and you can find it on very easily. If you want to see what it looks like, you can go online and do a search for it and it'll explain it, the whole process. Why would they do that if they didn't feel an inadequacy in the good deeds system. So I think I don't understand how the rabbis could with one verse of scripture completely obliterate the entire book of Leviticus, but that's what it does. Most people today don't have a concept of sacrifice, but you know some do have a concept of sin. And like I said before, um Without an understanding that you're a sinner, you can't come to Christ. So this is, you're not looking for a savior. If you don't see yourself as a sinner, you're not looking for a savior. My husband, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story that it's really his story to tell, but I hope he doesn't mind. He, he ministered for probably 10 years to this Jewish man who he came to love as a grandfather. His name was Meyer. And Meyer was really a curmudgeon. He was gruff and he was in, I think he was, he may have been in his late seventies when Tom first started uh, teaching him. He would come to Tom's Atlantic City Bible study. 
And he kind of got lured there by the hostess because he used to do her taxes. And she'd make him come on the night of the Bible study and he'd sit in the kitchen. And eventually he, he and Tom became friends, not at the beginning. He was really mad at Tom at the beginning, but then he slowly, they slowly became friends. And I'm not going to get into it, but over a, about a period of 10 years and a lot of stuff happened. Um, I hope someday my husband will write it all down in a book because it would be a wonderful book to read. But there was a lot of stuff. Meyer almost died, a lot of stuff. But in the end, uh, Meyer got saved. And it wasn't until after he came to Christ and he had been saved a while. He was living in a nursing home and my husband went to the nursing home to get him out and take him out to eat and all that. And uh, he told my husband that he had such an acute guilt over things he had done in his life that he knew were sin because he grew up in a religious family. He wouldn't even make Aliyah to the Bema, which means in, in a Jewish service, when you read the Torah, there are certain men from the congregation who are given what's called an aliyah. I don't know why that when we say about talk about people immigrating to Israel, we also we always pronounce it aliyah. But when you talk in my synagogue anyway, when you spoke of people going up to the podium to the it's called the bima, the platform uh, to read from the Torah, we always called it an aliyah. And the first person who came who came up who had the was given the great honor of saying the prayer before the man who actually read the Torah started reading, uh, that would always be someone who thought he was from the tribe of Aaron, who was a Kohen from the priestly line, from Aaron's line. And then it would be someone who thought he was a Levite. I don't know how they knew what they were, but because there are no records, it must be word of mouth. And then it would, all the others, and they're usually seven Aliyahs, um, it would just be from any anybody, any tribe. And he would not go up. They would ask him to go up and say the prayer before the uh, cantor chanted the Torah portions, but he wouldn't do it because he felt guilty over his sin. And he said he was always looking for a way out of it, but you know, he was Jewish, so it took him like 10 years before he came to know the Lord. But when he did, that's when he opened up and he started talking to my husband about it. Some people are dealing with things they probably, Jewish and Gentile, this is for everybody. They probably are dealing with things in their lives that they know they shouldn't have done. And sometimes the Lord convicts them so that they really start to feel guilty this is what happened with me. And some, I, I remember one of the, you know, one of the things that really bothered me, this may sound really silly to you, but when my mother got cancer when I was in sixth grade and she suffered tremendously, my brother was in third grade. She never got better. She never went into remission. She had every kind of operation known to man. And then she died in agony after four months in the hospital. And while she was sick before she ended up in the hospital because there was no hospice back then um she redid my bedroom she used to sew and she i had these little cafe curtains that she sewed for me that i really liked and she thought that i would like drapes because i was getting a little bit older i was in high school and she i don't know how she did it but she probably worked at night i know she used to sew at night and she made these drapes and I went into my bedroom and I hated them. I just, I wanted my little cafe curtains and my father started to get mad at me. And my mother said, just let it go, let it go. And the next day the cafe curtains were back up to this day. I feel so guilty about that. I can't tell you how it gnawed away at me because she died pretty soon after that. I never apologized. I never said I was sorry. I felt like the worst daughter in the world and she was the best mother in the world. Little things like that even, you know, 
can God can use even something like that. He can always use the big stuff. We know he can use the big stuff, but he can use little things too to make a person realize that they are sinners. They need salvation. And the scripture says that it's only through the blood. Leviticus 17, 11 says, I've given the blood to you upon the altar to make atonement for the soul, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. I remember before Meyer got saved, he called to talk to Tom about something. And I, I was talking to him and I was, uh, I don't know, I was witnessing to him. I don't remember what I said. And Meyer said the typical, ah, oh, when you're dead, you're dead. I said, Meyer, King David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He didn't think when you were dead, you're dead. And, you know, he, he appreciated King David. And, and he said, well, okay. And I, he said, but we all go to the same place. I said, so you're telling me that Adolf Hitler I've got a, your internet connection is unstable again. Uh, I got, um, I said, so you're trying to tell me that Adolf Hitler and Moses and King David are all going to the same place. And he stopped for a minute and he said, well, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> so he was, you know, there are all, there's always something the Lord will give you that you can say if someone makes a comment to you like that. But um, one, one last thing that I want to mention is a lot of Jewish people say that Jesus never claimed to be God. I heard this all the time from members of my family. My aunt used to say, oh, you know, he was a good Jewish boy and the, those Gentiles, they made a whole religion out of him that he never intended. I've heard this a lot. He never said he was God. He never said he was the Messiah. But it's people like Paul and everybody else who just concoct all this stuff. That's not true. One of the things you want to do is be prepared, be ready to answer these kinds of objections. I'm going to give you a few verses, and there's many more, but he did claim to be God. In John 10, 30, he said, I and my father are one. And in John 10, 33, the Jews said to him, you being a man, make yourself out to be God. So they knew that he was claiming deity. Some people say he never claimed to be king. He did. In John, I'm not going to read all these, but John 18, 37, Mark 15, 2, he claimed to be the king of the Jews, and he claimed to be the Messiah of Israel. Matthew 26, I think it is, I have, I have a typo here, so I'm not sure, uh, verses 62 through 64, and Luke 22 verses 67 through 71. So these are verses that are good to know. The other thing you might, this and this came on the sheet that you got. If you want to explain the gospel to someone Jewish, you cannot go directly to the New Testament. I, If you'd have shown me the New Testament, I'd have said, well, you know, you're a goy, you believe in Jesus. You, you, first of all, you're a pagan, you worship a pagan God. And I'm not going to go to your pagan book that is probably all concocted by who knows what, by people. You got to show them out of the Old Testament. And everything that you need from the New Testament is in the Old Testament. I know that Chris gave you these notes, so I don't have to go through all of these. But there are, there are verses that talk about sin and how sin separates you from God and the, the punishment uh, for sin is death and that the Messiah was going to come to be a sacrifice and that he would die, but he would rise again in Isaiah 53. That's the best. You know, when Svi Kalisher would go, uh, he was always using Isaiah 53 in Israel and Anytime he opened it up, 
he used to call it the chapter that they boycott because they don't want to they don't want to teach Isaiah 53. Anytime he went to Isaiah 53, people would the and he always was dealing with ultra orthodox. They would say to him, "Oh, we know who you are. You're one of those Christians trying to convert us." And he would say, "Look at my Bible. Is it kosher? Meaning is it the Hebrew scriptures?" You know, it was right out of Isaiah. But they it's such a clear picture of Jesus that if you read it to somebody who has been taught, missionaries use Isaiah 53. You know, it's always missionaries. I don't like to think of myself as a missionary. It's a like a red herring. We teach the Bible. We're Bible teachers. Everybody at the Friends of Israel, everybody from Jim Showers, who's the executive director and president, all the way down to uh, uh, any job, buildings and grounds, every single person there knows how to present the gospel and can probably present the gospel properly to a Jewish person because they have love for Jewish people and they've had some training. And we are Bible teachers. Everybody there can teach the word of God. Some teach the word of God for a living Others teach the word of God, not for a living. They, they, the Lord's called them to do something else, but they can still teach. They still know enough that they can open up the Bible and teach the word of God. And, and I'm very, very excited about Friends of Israel for that reason. I'm, I hate to use the word proud, but I really am. We have a fantastic faculty, staff, everybody on staff, everybody who works for us. And they all love the Lord and they probably can all open up the word of God and be able to teach you something. And you, if you want to talk to somebody Jewish, you have to use the Hebrew scriptures. They'll, they'll come a point where you can go to the New Testament. But I, you know, I used to have this one woman, uh, she was an elderly woman. I think she, she died a number of years ago. She was like 103 when she died. She, used to come over here. She was a widow. Her husband was an attorney. And he, her, her husband's alma mater was Princeton University. And she used to get the Princeton University bulletin all the time. And she was very upset about, and this was years ago, probably 20 years ago. She was upset because there was a lot of gay stuff in the Princeton, this Princeton University thing. And she wanted to know what the Bible said about that. So she called me up and she said, she knew what I believed because I talked to her about it very carefully. And she said, I don't want the New Testament. I just want just the Old way. Testament. <laughs> Is, what happened? I just heard a little, okay. I guess we're okay. We're okay, right? You're fine. You're okay. fine. She just wanted the Old Testament. But I knew where to go, and I showed her from the Old Testament. So it's only when someone really gets close to accepting Christ, to understanding who Jesus actually is, that you can probably go to the New Testament and they'll be okay with it. Otherwise, you really need to be able to know the verses in the Old Testament. And my husband says he always writes the Jerusalem Road in the front of his Bible. Because sometimes if you are talking to someone and they're willing, they want you to, they want to see, they'll say, okay, you know, show me. You can forget what they are and you can get nervous. It's good to have it written down somewhere so that you can just look at it and you don't have that fear of forgetting what the verses are. So I would recommend you can write them, you know, that you write it down. So um, this, I think I've been going, have I been going too long? You're no, fine, you're, Lorna. You're, you're, Steve, I, you're, if you want to take some questions or if you still want to hear anything. Oh, oh no. How about now, Lorna? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. You can, if you'd like to take questions now, you're more, you, you, you okay. do whatever you want, okay? Yeah, I'll take questions if you have questions. You know, I actually see, uh, I see this here, Lorna, from Penny. She asked a great question here that maybe you can speak into. How can you witness to Jews and Gentiles when they don't believe in the authority of the scriptures? 
I'm stuck on this. I've been taught over many decades to use scriptures, whether Old Testament or New Testament, <laughs> but I'm still stuck. Boy, that's a really issue. good question. Varna, 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 you know, I, I've been saying for a while, I wonder how successful a Billy, even a Billy Graham would be in the 21st century, uh, because I always am amazed when I watch his revivals uh, and his conferences, he just speaks from the scriptures and people would respond, but would people respond today because he <laughs> used the authority of the scriptures to draw people to the Lord? Um, so anyway, I, I, I feel the same way as Penny. Well, you know, Billy Graham had, a, had said something uh, one time. He said he tries to use as many scriptures as he can, he could, in his messages. One message I, in particular, I think he had like 143 scriptures because he says, he said, the Lord will take his word and drive it supernaturally into the human heart. So if people don't believe in the authority of scripture, um, I'm not sure you really have to believe in the authority of scripture for the Lord. If the Lord is going to do something in your life, hmm. uh, he's going to use his, his word anyway, whether you believe it or not. Um, but I think sometimes you have to know when to use scripture and when to just talk and, and try and talk to people. Um, you don't want to preach at them. So you don't want to, when Billy Graham preached, he talked about common things. He talked about, um, uh, you know, trouble in the world and all that. And then he would use this, the scriptures, but, you know, he, when you're sitting at, it's a little different when you're standing up there with a couple million people watching you than when you're sitting at your kitchen table with a friend trying to lead them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to be sensitive. I do think though, that God, even though a person doesn't really believe the scripture, if the Lord is working in their life, he'll use it anyway. Chris? I, I love that quote from Billy Graham that I do he'll drive Chris? it supernaturally into the human heart. Yes. Yeah. Steve, I hear you. Okay. Uh, Lorna, I, I really appreciate what you said. And, you know, the word says his word doesn't return empty or void, but sometimes the only Bible people read is your life. You are the word in that sense, as people watch you. And I'm sure Tom would have something to say about Meyer patience tom's with them the whole time yeah uh, well that's you know, how I mrs would... bennett was my mother-in-law that's right that i watched her only... like a hawk that sometimes the only bible people read is your life uh lorna can you hear me yes uh madeline writes i have a new jewish friend she says her belief is in the islamic faith oh. where do i be <laughs> Where do I begin in witnessing to her? She told me that she was raised in a non-practicing Jewish home. I would honestly, I don't even know. I think um, I, I would have to know more. Like, why would she go to the Islamic faith? What, what attracted her to Islam? Start with the Quran. Yeah. I mean, the Quran, I mean, Islamic, the Islamic faith is uh, not a great says faith for women. Jews. And the Quran says to kill Jews. And so I yeah, would say. It says to kill Jews and it says to kill Christians. So I I look would, at all the I Christians her, in Nigeria. It's like a believe, genocide going on in Nigeria right now. And it's the Muslims killing, they're massacring the Christians. Which is exact, I, which would be, why would you want, why would you be attracted to some? some religion where the word in their religion says to kill her to kill people mm, right her her she's jewish yes. so yeah. that's where you start you let her see the truth remember what you said about the truth lorna truth is key there you go okay. great if anybody else has a question for lorna too this is her last class 
um, this would be a great uh, opportunity for you to share your thoughts or your uh, your comments or a question. Lorna, just to encourage you, Ben Vasquez, a good friend of ours, a graduate of Bridges, a graduate of Encounter, a graduate of our Origins program in Atlanta, wrote, this was fantastic. Thank you, Lorna. Do you have oh, plans to continue you. writing in the future or perhaps another book? Your story is incredible. I can't hear. Oh, he's asking, do you have any plans to write a future book? <laughs> Gosh, that's like the third person today to ask me that question. <laughs> Not at the moment. All right, uh, Marsha Line, uh, I hope I did justice to your word, friend, I, or to your name. I thought the word Bible was a red flag for a Jewish person, but V said he came uh, with, uh, you said he came with a Bible. Mm -hmm. I would choose to say the Hebrew scriptures. Is this really important? Well, not to me, because um, we called it Bible. But when we say Bible, we're, we're thinking the Bible is only the Old Testament, only the Hebrew scriptures. Hebrew scriptures are the Bible to me. That's mm -hmm. how I grew up. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody, but it, it wouldn't bother me to hear the word Bible. Yeah, what and bothered, it, it would bother me more if somebody said, well, you have to read the New Testament. Yeah. And to me, I, that's not the Bible. That was, you know, back then, to me, that wasn't the Bible. The Bible was the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah, any experience I've ever had sharing with uh, with my Jewish friends, the term Bible never became a, no. a stumbling block. Uh, I sometimes say Tanakh or Torah or Bible, and it never was like... Uh, but like you said, if you say New Testament, that that was the it moves them into a new category of yes. what, what the Bible is. Um, I, I like this. Pinky again commented earlier on. She said the key verse for me has always been Leviticus seventeen eleven. Um, Lois writes, "Excellent, thank you." Any other questions or comments? Um, uh, here we go, uh, uh, Julie. Again, excellent study. I've learned a lot. Thank you, Lorna. Um, I hope that encourages you. Uh, just um, uh, Paul, uh, our friend on the boat, writes, there's a lot of Orthodox Jewish people in Toronto. Donna writes, I'm wondering about prophecy and the third temple. Will there be re in, uh, a reinstatement of sacrifice? Ooh, Larna, great question. I think absolutely. I think that's the goal. Uh, they have a lot of the uh, implements already made. Uh, I don't, I don't know what the status is today, but when I haven't been to Israel in a long time, my husband just got back from Israel a few weeks ago, but I haven't been in, in, I think, 25 years. And even then, 25 years ago, the Friends of Israel tour that we were on took us to the Temple Mount, uh, I think it was called the Temple Mount Institute. And we saw some of the utensils that they've already made in anticipation of a third temple and having the resumption of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. They have the late, the bowls for the blood and all kinds of things. There's a group in Israel that is really working hard to do this, to get this, uh, get sacrifices reinstituted. Yep. Uh, uh, Lorna, Sylvia Hamilton writes, are the Hebrew scriptures only the first five books of the Old Testament? No. When we talk about the Hebrew scriptures, we talk about everything. The first five books are the Torah, the law, the books of the law. And then there's the Torah, the we it's the the Torah, and the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim, which is the Torah, the prophets and the writings. And they put uh well, the prophets, I think, I'm not sure my husband would be better at doing, at answering this question than me, because I just always studied the prophets. That was what we were always given to translate. But they they put uh, some of the, by the books that we put in one area, they put in another area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the writings, I don't think they considered Daniel in the in with the prophets, all right, Tom, maybe you can unmute yourself and you can, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, Daniel is in the writings. Um, they've also combined Ezra and Nehemiah into to one book. 
uh, and the Bible ends there, the uh, Hebrew Bible ends with Chronicles, because Chronicles is a summary of everything that's gone before. Uh, but Daniel's not part of the prophets. Our historical books are the former prophets, and then we have the latter prophets, which would be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, the 12, which are the minor prophets, are all put together because of size. Um, trying to think anything else. The writings is the uh, last section, and it's probably to the Jewish people the least authoritative. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Orthodox uh, really only believe that the Torah is inspired. I don't, and the other the other branches. I don't know if they believe anything's inspired inspired by God, but the orth the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox for sure, believe that the Torah is inspired by God. The Orthodox may believe that the Torah is inspired by God, but the rest of the of the they're not denominations; they're branches of Judaism. Uh, they they pretty much. So I don't think they believe anything's actually inspired. And some well-known writers, actually, like Chaim Potok, who wrote uh, The Chosen, um, he would, I read a book that he wrote where he was talking about the scriptures. And when it says uh, in, you know, in Exodus, how God came down in fire on the mountain, and it says that the Israelites heard the voice of God, they actually heard the Ten Commandments in a voice. I, and I wanted to know what he thought of that. And he said, well, who can understand that? <laughs> eh, who knows? Eh, you could just hear him. Eh, who, yep. who knows what happened? <laughs> uh, and let me do another question for you here, Lorna, if you're okay with that. Sure. Uh, um, Julie writes, how would you start a conversation with a Jewish person who doesn't believe in God? Well, I think you have to let the conversation just start naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, when Tom and I were, uh, we were at this Starbucks in Florida, and we were sitting next to these, I, I don't know if I mentioned it uh, last week or not, but we were sitting next to these two uh, women in their 20s, and it sounded like they were either speaking Arabic or Hebrew, and I decided it was Hebrew. So I, it sounded, I picked out a few words. So I looked, and Tom had just gotten back from Israel like a few days earlier. And um, I looked at them and I said, are you speaking Hebrew? And they said, yes. And I said, oh, my husband just got back from Israel. We love Israel. Well, right away, they told me after that they were afraid to speak Hebrew. They didn't know whether they had to decide whether to speak Hebrew or not, because so, so many people hate Israel. So we just started a conversation and we just were talking to them and and then they were telling us some of the things that were going on. And I just said, you know, God really loves Israel, though. He loves you. I mean, he says in the Bible, and they said, well, we don't believe in the Bible. And but it didn't matter because we had such a good conversation. And uh, there's ways, gentle ways that you can tell them that God loves them and that uh, he's, his eyes are always on the land of Israel. And she, one of the girls said to me, she said, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I wouldn't mind looking at the new Testament, but the old Testament, eh, you know, she's, eh, she wasn't too enamored of that. Unfortunately, you know, we weren't going to have a, a lot of time with them, but, uh, I did give them my phone number and I said, I know you're on WhatsApp because everybody in Israel is on WhatsApp. So you're going to be in the United States here. I'm on WhatsApp and you can text me if you need anything, but sometimes you just have to just show them that, you know, you, I, you know, there's not one pat answer for every situation. I really feel a conversation has to just flow. You can't try to create a way to to throw God in there. He'll bring himself in. I wasn't going to say anything, but the way they started talking, it became a natural thing for me to, to say what I said and for Tom to say what he said. It, the Lord makes a way. It never works if you're, if you decide you're going to force it, you know, forcing it doesn't work. 
it doesn't work with anybody. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not Jewish. Exactly, exactly. It's, you just can't force something like that. I mean, there's a lot of people I've tried to witness to who are what, you know, Methodist or whatever. They, they're they in the same spot. They don't believe in God. They don't believe the Bible. It It's, you just can't force something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorna, Walter writes, you provided a good roadmap what to avoid and pursue in witnessing it to a Jewish person. Very inspiring. Um, Carrie Gould writes, any suggestions on how to respond to a Jewish friend who views my act of service to them as a mitzvah? Um, I don't think that that will, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, really, as long as they don't think you're doing it to make points with God. A mitzvah is a good deed. So if they look at you as doing something good, you know, God wants us to do good. He says he created us to do good. He didn't create us to do evil. As long as they understand that you're not getting point, you're not doing a mitzvah to get points with God, you already are uh, sure that you have eternal life, that you're going to heaven. You're doing it just because you love the Jewish people and you want to be there for them. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great response. Uh, Stephanie wrote, God bless you, Larna. Your testimony is beautiful and reveals God's amazing grace. I work with a dear Jewish man who is unable to have children and feels that God has shunned him and his oh, wife. Do you have any words of wisdom for this particular situation? Oh, Thank my you. goodness. That's, you know, I, we have a friend at Friends of Israel. His name is Elliot Jager. He has lived in Israel since 1985. I believe he's, he grew up in Brooklyn. He's a journalist. He wrote a whole book about that. He is a Jewish man who has, does not know Jesus as his savior. And he wrote about his struggle with childlessness, not being able to have children. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I really have an answer for that. It's not a punishment. Um, I know that God works through adversity uh, because sometimes he takes the difficult things in our lives and he uses it to draw us to himself. I don't think he, I don't think that when you can't have children, you're being punished. Uh, I just think that- uh, Lorna? Yes. Uh, there's a passage in the, what your answer is actually the best. You don't know. There's mm -hmm. a passage in Deuteronomy that says, the secret things yes. belong to the Lord. And yes. So we only know that God is loving, yes. just, holy, he's righteous, uh, and he is incredibly more smart than we are because he knows all and sees all. So while it's heartbreaking and incredibly uh, hard for us to understand because, Elliot, you're a nice guy, we, we, you'd make a wonderful father, whatever you want to say. The point is, in, in the sovereignty of God and in his providence, he would be no different than Job, who had no idea what Satan was doing. Uh, and all you could say, and I'm sure, I'm sure Elliot would probably say it, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's the same with Christians. You know, I have a, a Christian friend who loves the Lord. She wanted a child and she was never able to have one so you know that it's a it's difficult but god uses all these things in our lives for a reason you know i always think it's amazing that there are these moments where you know you don't know what someone's view is of god until sometimes they're suffering and then all of a sudden it comes out and they start to you know god's punishing me or so now all of a sudden you have a viewpoint of, oh, well, this person believes in a God, but through their suffering and they have a view of God that isn't in line with his nature and character. And I think that is actually <laughs> the greatest thing that you can do in those moments, especially when someone's feeling as though they're being shunned by God or punished by God. 
uh, that God is the opposite of that. He wants to bestow his grace and kindness and mercy on us, even as like Steve was saying, when we don't understand. Um, so yes, that's always a very, that's a difficult one for Jewish people and Gentiles as well. It so. is, it is. You know, when my husband died, um, we had only been married five years and our daughter was three years old. And it was a very, very difficult time. Hmm. And I, I remember I asked, uh, actually, <laughs> Um, I remember when uh, Tom and I got married four years later, and actually we had Chuck Shidey over here at our home for dinner, and I remember telling him that I was afraid to ask why. Why did you take, you know, James? And Dr. Shidey said, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking why. Jesus was on the cross and he said, why did you, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And um, was there some times we're just never going to understand why certain things are the way they are. But that's one of my favorite verses is in Job where he says, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Mm. And I think that's the key is to trust in God, no matter what, and to trust that he knows what's best. He never makes a mistake. I have a friend in church. I remember she was telling me, she said to her husband one time, she said, you know, I just don't understand why God did this. And if I were God, I'd have done it differently. And her husband looked at her and said, honey, if you were God, you would have done it exactly the same way. Mm, yeah because he's never wrong and he never makes a mistake. Hmm. Uh, Lorna, um, Bev um, Richards says, wouldn't you just love to speak one more time at the Christian Women's Club? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting speaking engagements through this, Lorna. I used to speak for Christian Women's Club a lot and I had to give it up because it just got too much for me when my right. kids were younger, but um, that's, I appreciate that question. I think I know Bev. <laughs> I don't think I've, if it's the Beverly Richards, I think it is. Uh, I haven't seen her in a, probably 30 years. Well, you have to go back and speak, Lorna. That'd be great. Well, everyone, listen, um, uh, I think this has been a fantastic class. I know it's been a fantastic class as I've been reading, um, uh, you know, all these amazing comments. I've been hearing great things. Um, uh, I just want to thank Lorna for her dedication and her time and her willingness to share uh, her faith. You know, a lot of times you, we can look to the scriptures, but the greatest resources that the Lord can give us is the testimony and the witness of other people and how they came to faith to give us the confidence to know, hey, you know what? I'm gonna to speak to my Jewish friend, or you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna speak truth into this situation because you know that God can change any heart. Um, and so we're thankful that Lorna would take time out of her very busy schedule. I know it's a very busy schedule because Steve and I and Tom, we write for the magazine and we know that we keep her very busy with all the corrections <laughs> she has to make. So I, I really appreciate you, Lorna, so much. Um, and taking the time to do this. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was a blessing. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more thing I want to say really quick. Emmeline said um, to, uh, that last week you mentioned that you had done a FOI uh, study Bible um, when you started serving with them. Um, was that something that was written and something that can be purchased or do you know? No, how? we were going to do it. That was when wow. Marv Rosenthal was the executive director. That was his project. And that's what we, he hired me for, to be the editor. And he had a deal with Thomas Nelson, who was going to publish it. And the people from Thomas Nelson came up to New Jersey to meet us. And uh, they told me the editor at Thomas Nelson that I would be working with. But then Marv left, and so that never 
panned out, I unfortunately. I still think it's a good idea. It would I be do a too. tremendous amount of work, but we have all the resources. We have so many resources. We actually could do that, but um, I don't think I'll live long enough to see it. <laughs> No, I'm sure you will. Great to, great to see everybody. Hey, just a little reminder, next July 21st, that's our next, it's our very first actually, FOI Equip lecture series with Basem Eid. I believe Laura stuck the link in here somewhere. Yep, here it is. I'm gonna copy and paste it and stick it down at the bottom right now for everyone to see as you're leaving. You can register here if you want to before you get off and you can sign up for Basem Eid. Um, and it's going to be a fantastic time. It's July 21st. It's actually going to be one hour later than our normal time. So just remember that because you know where we get complaints from? The West Coast. Those West Coasters, three hours away, okay? They are always saying, can you just push it? <laughs> That's right. Can you just push it back a little bit because we'd love to join because it's 4.30 when we start our class in the West Coast. So we're going to push it back for the... Um, for these uh, for the Basem Eid series uh, lecture series soon enough you'll be able to find it at FOI Equip as well everybody thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you July 21st Lorna thank you so much Steve thank you. appreciate you too thank you so much Tom I have a question for Tom um, I noticed you're not uh, teaching um, in Lancaster will we will we see you at the prophecy conference I doubt it um the conference is only running i think what friday saturday sunday correct yeah yeah um i i don't think so um that's i i i am invited and serve at the at the pleasure and request of friends of israel and uh, since my presence was was not needed i figured that i would end up being somewhere else but i wish i could see you okay we got to get together sometime you're in north jersey right uh south jersey now Oh, you're in South Jersey? Well, that's even easier. Yeah. I'm sorry? That's even easier. We got to get together. Oh, yeah. We're not far. We can get together. Okay. But I wish I was going to see. I hope you get to go and have a good time. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Laila Tov, Lahitro, Shalom, the whole nine yards. Thank you again. It was wonderful. Thank you, Lorna, great job. Oh, thank you. Very, very nice. I enjoyed it. You hit a home run, Lorna. <laughs> you did hit a home run.